Hello, and welcome to Behind the Horror. Scary movie fans, such as myself, will hear that a movie is based on a true story. A few of them we already know, but most, well, we never go on to find out just what that true story is. So, in this series, we will explore and find out exactly what the true story is behind the movies we love. The 2005 movie, Hostel, starts us off by having us listen to someone happily whistling while they're cleaning up blood and gore. The opening credits literally let you know what world you are about to step into. And side note, I noticed The Walking Dead's Greg Nicotero is listed in the opening credits as one of the special effects and makeup artists, which is pretty damn cool. We hear a very heavy metal door shut, then we are taken to a city where some friends come busting out of a building labeled Hostel. And for those of you that might not be aware, a hostel is a place where travelers can go and stay together in sort of a communal or shared space. It's like a college dorm room and many travelers like using them and I can see the appeal. You know, they get together and exchange stories. I think it might be kind of fun. So these friends go into a place in Amsterdam where they can sit and smoke some weed they then move on to a sort of rave where they are dancing and meeting girls. One friend is even in the bathroom having sex while taking selfies. One gets into a fight and they all wind up getting kicked out of the club. It is obvious though that this trio of pals are not bad guys, they're just looking for a good time and then they go on to the red light district and go into a brothel. Once they get their fill, as they say, they return to the hostel, only they realize that they're locked out for the night because it's later than the establishment's curfew. So another guy says, hey guys, you can come stay at my place. So they go back there, they continue smoking weed, they're watching a couple literally have sex. The guy then shows them these digital photos on his camera of these beautiful girls, photo after photo, and he tells them that he had his way with them, so to speak, in a hostel in Slovakia. So of course the next day they hop onto a train and travel there. Now while on the train, an older gent comes into their compartment and he starts showing off a picture of his very young daughter in his wallet and they start talking. But it's very strange. He pulls out this bowl of salad and he's eating the lettuce with his fingers. It was kind of odd. They ask him if he would like a fork, but he declines. The man, when he finds out the young men are on their way to Slovakia, begins to say it's wonderful there with their casinos and girls. Finally, they arrive at their destination, and while having a look around, they see that the town seems mm, quiet and a bit, I don't know, spread out. It's definitely not a big city area where there are lots of nightclubs and plenty of pubs and cafes and whatnot. It is very much an old town, but with beautiful architecture everywhere. They go into the hostel they're going to stay at and on a TV plays the movie Pulp Fiction and that's relevant because this movie was also helped created by Quentin Tarantino. At first this place seems to be everything they were told it was. Absolutely beautiful girls walking around in the spa area completely naked and happy to see the young men. They go with some girls to a sort of nightclub later that night and are given some drugs to take. There they see the older man from the train again. Overall they have a wonderful night, wake up the next morning to find that one of their traveling companions checked out without them. 
They start walking around and see their friend, or so they believe. So they begin to holler for him and give chase, where they walk into a museum of torture and realize that the man that they were following was not their friend, but he did have his coat on. They leave the museum and receive a text message from their friend that shows his face and a message that says, I go home. These are the old flip phones. The camera qualities were not great. We are then taken to where that friend actually is and we quickly find out that he is dead. The picture is of their friend, no doubt, but it was only his face because his head has been removed from his body. We again hear the happy whistling of the person who enjoys cleaning up blood and gore as they walk down a hallway toward a girl who is sitting in a chair, bound and screaming in terror. The person promptly begins to cut one of her toes off. What happens to the two remaining traveling companions? Well, for those of you that have seen the movie, no. And the rest, you'll just have to watch and find out. But this one's kind of a soft core porn thing for the first half, so a little bit of warning there. Now, according to the writer and director of the movie, Eli Roth, he said it was largely based on a very creepy encounter with a specific website someone told him about, where apparently you could travel to Thailand, and for the sum of a measly $10,000, you could walk into a room with a trapped person inside and just shoot them in the head and kill them. The site promoted it as the person to be killed actually signed up to be killed because a sizable amount of the money earned from this activity would go to their families who were very poor. It basically offered the ability for thrill-seeking murderers to have another means to take a human life. Another sick game is that in Thai villages, organized crime syndicates rule and poverty forces people to basically sell their family members for a large amount of money. These bought and paid for people are then taken into cities where the elite, or at least the ones who have serious issues, will gamble to see how long their victim survives being tortured. It was said that there are people who can't seem to get the same high off of drugs or can't, you know, finish during sex due to having it in abundance and available to them at all times and they are desperate for another thrill, the adrenaline rush. So of course it would seem that murder would be the next logical substitute, right? Because no. So this is where I will trepidatiously discuss some examples of how this could be happening all over the world. But it touches on conspiracy theories and I'm hesitant to go down that path with my content, but I think it's appropriate for this particular podcast. What this whole situation is, is basically saying that some of the super rich and elite people of the world who are completely out of touch with reality will push the limits of human decency well past anything fathomable, let alone acceptable. So let's set the scene. Now, I can only give you the perspective from my own life experience, okay? My family history came from nothing. My grandparents got married with barely a dollar between them. They scratched and climbed and worked hard to carve out a middle-class existence for their children. Then I was raised in a lower middle-class situation where it was just myself and my mother. I didn't do without, I didn't starve, but we didn't have a lot. So as I grew up, worked in a grocery store to help pay for college, started working and so on, I truly appreciated having a decently newish vehicle, though I've never had a brand new one ever. And I appreciate my small house that I own and that I live pretty near a lake and I can go do 
inexpensive but fun things on occasion. Believe me, I've had to work my ass off for what I have and I am still 100% fully aware that my life is 10 times better than most in the world. But I'm not perfect. I also complain when it's hot outside or if the air conditioner in my truck won't get cold fast enough. People who have less than me would never think to complain about those types of things and I think we all try to be sensitive to that and appreciate what we do have. But people who belong to the class of elitists that have the kind of money and status we could never even comprehend, well, they can't really relate to normal people. They've never even owned a used car. Most have never even driven themselves anywhere. They've seen all of the places, all of them. The Bora Boras, the south of France, Australia, Greenland, Europe and Asia and South America and places that I will never be able to see. I've actually only been to a handful of states outside of the one that I live in. These super rich people bought their way into every possible experience and they are bored. Then when you add things like personality disorders into the mix, among other things, it's like the director of the movie said, the drugs and sex eventually do nothing for them. They have to go above and beyond to get that rush. And this is where you get people like Jeffrey Epstein and Harvey Weinstein. Of course, probably most all of us know who Jeffrey Epstein is. There's a docu-series on him on Netflix that explains it all pretty well. His net worth when he died was estimated to be $577 million. And it's no secret that it is pretty questionable as to how he amassed that much wealth. He was described as an American financer and investor, but it's pretty widely accepted that he procured and quote sold children and teens into the sex trade with other pedophilic uber rich people. He committed suicide close to a year ago after being put in jail awaiting trial for those accusations. And by suicide, you know, most of us believe he was murdered to keep him quiet because he had proof of many, many high profile people in very powerful positions engaging in these activities. There is a doctor and YouTuber by the name of Dr. Todd Grande who covered the mental health and personality of Jeffrey Epstein. I love Dr. Grande. He is a great resource of a wide variety of people and situations that he breaks down and explains beautifully. In his video about Epstein, he says that Jeffrey most likely did not suffer from a pedophilic disorder because that specific disorder doesn't apply for victims over the age of 13, but it was a possibility. Dr. Grande stated that as far as personality pathology, Jeffrey seemed to fit the narcissistic and antisocial labels. He indicated that this would make him an extremely dangerous offender. Harvey Weinstein is a film producer, or was, formerly for Miramax Films and other stuff. He got very rich very quickly and used his influence in Hollywood to sexually abuse, assault, and rape many women in that industry. His abuses helped the hashtag MeToo movement get the momentum it needed to get the word out. He was eventually arrested and charged with rape in 2018 and was found guilty of two more felonies just this year. His conviction is still causing a domino effect, exposing other powerful and influential people in the media industry who are just as vile as him. Some of his victims were Kate Beckinsale, Rosanna Arquette, Kate Blanchett, Cara Delevingne, Rose McGowan, Gwyneth Paltrow, 
Heather Graham, Salma Hayek, for Christ's sake. I mean, the list is nearly a hundred different women and nearly all of them actresses. And then my friends, there is also a whole thing revolving around the subject of red rooms. If you don't know about them, this isn't going to be pleasant. Red rooms are supposedly a live streaming show of sorts of torture, murder, accessed through sites on the dark or deep web. Wealthy users pay for the live feed of the torture and murder using Bitcoin, which is a virtual and anonymous currency. The exceptionally rich can also pay extra to have their form of torture used on the victim trapped in the room. There are also supposedly these gladiator fights where people will literally fight to the death for people to pay to watch. On the dark web, there are apparently hireable hitmen. There's Nazi-like human experiments and even humans, almost always children, that are freely sold for anyone to purchase and those are almost always pedophiles. And it just gets worse from there, guys. Now, the media loves to say that these live streaming rooms simply do not exist. But I'm not so sure. It seems pretty believable to me, considering what other things we all know humans do and are capable of. If someone thought the idea of Red Rooms up, well, the chances are significant that it does and has existed. And then we get into the theories behind the Illuminati. Now, this in and of itself is a rabbit hole that we just don't have time to go down. But if you actually want me to touch on any of this in separate podcasts, then let me know. I don't know if I believe all of it, but I very much keep an open mind about a great many things. So the idea that some of the most rich but mentally disturbed people in the world are paying large amounts of money to partake in horrible torture, child porn, pedophilic, murderous activities, whether virtually or in person, though horrific, seems pretty plausible to me. As I sit here in my air-conditioned house, working at a desk and nibbling on a snack, oblivious to the sufferings of some poor, helpless woman my own age in a third world country who was on her third day without food or shelter, it isn't a stretch to think that that level of separation would extend to people of far more means than I'd ever be able to comprehend. At a severely lacking or complete absent ability to empathize with others, and this movie moves into the category of highly probable. Thanks for listening. <laughs>